Welcome to the second installment of Astro Chat with Jiminy and Apollo astronaut Dick Gordon. Alan H7 would like to know, do you have any regrets that you stay with the lunar program in hopes of landing on the moon? Well, that's a great question. In hindsight, if I had known that I was not going to fly uh, an additional Apollo mission, I would have certainly uh, gone with uh, Pete Conrad and Al Bean, as it turned out, to, uh, to fly again. That's what I came to NASA for, was to fly in space. And if I had known that there was not going to be an 18 and I had a chance to fly it, uh, I would have certainly uh, changed my mind. But I had to take that chance. I did want to complete that last 60 miles. Delta 7 would like to know, what's your most vivid memory of your Jiminy spacewalk? How difficult, well, the most vivid memory I have is how difficult the task happened to be. You know, now we see it all the time and it's a very successful operation, but in the early days we we were somewhat ignorant, I, I would say, at least I was, of the difficulties of working in space without support. And by support, I mean hand holds, foot restraints, uh, lap belts, some, some way to hold you at your workstation so that you could use both hands uh, to complete a task. Uh, what I was trying to do was I equate that to uh, trying to tie your shoelace with one hand. And, and without restraint system, that's uh, it's a virtually impossible situation. What's your favorite aircraft? Boy, that's, that's a great question. As a naval aviator, I obviously would have to uh, talk about naval aircraft, but. Uh, even though I have flown several of the Air Force aircraft. The non-afterburning uh, jet airplane would probably be the Navy's FJ-3, which is akin to the Air Force's F-86. An afterburning airplane would probably be a toss-up between a Phantom, the F-4, and a Crusader, the f 8 u And as far as a prop airplane, my second airplane that I ever flew was a Bearcat, uh, the F-8F, and it was a real fun airplane to fly. Of those three or four airplanes, uh, I, I can't make that distinction. I'd love to fly any of them today. Was there a single moment where you felt like you were home from the moon? Yeah, I think so. And uh, when I walked in the house and uh, was greeted with, with, by my six children, I, I think I realized I was back home. When you woke after your cat nap during EVA aboard Gemini, what were your feelings waking up to a view of Earth from orbit? Well, it was the same view that I had before I took the little cat nap. I was outside the spacecraft, actually standing in the hatch, was restrained. And uh, the cat nap was done during the daylight portion of, of the orbit because our work was during the night side pass. So, uh, I saw the Earth uh, in full panorama once I got outside the spacecraft, but the view prior to the nap is the same as after the nap. Do you ever dream of space? Not really. Uh, I, I think moments like this or the weekend when you're being questioned about it or you're back into the environment, I think it's automatic that you think of space and the things you did. But, uh, uh, it's not a part of my life anymore. There was eight years of it, but uh, I'm old enough to realize that eight years is a very small segment of the time I've spent here on Earth, so I don't dwell on it. But it's kind of fun to talk about it. We're in a group like the weekend uh, for the Astronaut Hall of Fame induction, and uh, being with friends that participated in the same thing, uh, it's something you'll never forget, but I don't dwell upon the situation. As you headed out from Earth on Apollo 12, did you reach a point where the lag in radio communications became noticeable or a nuisance? No, I don't think, well, it became noticeable, but it certainly did, uh, did not become a nuisance because uh, I think at lunar distances, uh, what is it, about one and a half seconds for the transmission to, to go to the Earth and then come back. But it, it's pretty simple because it's a pause after a sentence, just like we would talk to each other here on Earth, it's not a rapid communication, but there's a, there's a slight pause, at least to give you a couple of seconds to think of what you're going to say in return. And documentaries he's seen from Apollo 12 suggest that Alan Bean is the only crew member who knew the SCE to AUX procedure following the lightning strike. Is this correct 
or did you know it also? Oh, I think uh, there's there's several comments uh, re regarding that. Uh, I was responsible for the design of the cockpit uh, uh, controls and displays, and uh, I certainly knew the SEC switch was. I put it there, and uh, I think it was right in front of Al, right in the middle of his uh, his reach of his instrument panel on the bottom row, and. Uh, I was more concerned that the Saturn V was going in the right direction and trying to communicate with uh, with Pete to, to let him know, particularly after the second strike when we lost the uh, attitude reference system. So uh, all we lost in that particular moment was the ability of the ground to uh, read what's going on in the spacecraft. We knew what was going on, so it was really not that big a concern, but we had to let the ground uh, re retrieve their information so they could help us during the flight.